Okay, that's kind of bright there. Too bright for me. Why is that like that today? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, let's see who's going to be the first to pop up. I see a big face and a big smile, but I don't see a name. Karen Cooper is the first one to jump up. Is that JoJo? Well, that's Joyce Calhoun and Diane King. Hey, how y'all doing? How y'all doing? Sit a few Fuqua on the line. Hey, I'm here to answer your questions, here to answer your questions. you have any questions? Angie, good to see you. Cheryl is consistent. You go, girl. Proud of you. Uh, all right, I think I just kicked in in my Bluetooth. Bonnie, good to see you. On the line, on the line, on the line. Wait on a few more people. Got quite a few jumped in quite early. Well, I'm uh, offering uh, this time period to uh, kind of holler at you and uh, let you know uh, or try to see what you're doing. Sean Reed is on the line. Okay, Sean, I see you. Are you still down south or you up north or where you at? I can't. Ho hold on a minute. Somebody try to talk to me. What are you saying? Fix my AirPod. Yeah, it, Oh, my wife is correcting me. I'm sorry. Hey, Michelle. Hey, Everett. Uh, uh, Yvette. Eunice. Hey, how you doing? Catherine's on the line. Hey, so grateful. I'm glad that you joined in with us. Any questions for me today? Any questions for me today? Kay is getting up with the program. All right, Kay. I'm with you. All right, all right. All right. Well, I thought I'd offer, uh, give opportunity for y'all to shoot me some questions, although I'm looking at flipping this, and I'd like to get your feedback on um, doing a question and answer period instead of before Bible class, after Bible class, um, that I would kind of switch uh, venues and go from, hey, Deacon Adams, and... Uh, brother-in-law and sister Tina on the line and Crandallin with your alias name up, the, up there. Good to see all of you. But I'm looking to switch, do Bible class on Facebook as I've been doing it, doing it live, and then switch over and do a Zoom call for uh, questions and answer periods so you can get some comments and questions in regards to the lesson that um, we just taught. I don't have that set up today, but uh, it's in the works to do. Uh, hey, Sister Jester uh, and Elaine and Sister Holmes. Hey, Michael Thomas, glad you made it on board, man. Um, so I'm looking at, at doing a Q&A, uh, maybe start next week if I get it set up where we would have our regular Bible class on uh, Facebook, and then we could go to a Zoom call if depending on how many people are going to be on the Zoom call. But we could do the, the Zoom call piece, and that way you could ask your questions without having to sit there and do one word at a time. Cheryl Benjamin Jackson back with us. Gigi, how you doing? Bob, you like that? Yeah, I was thinking about a uh, way we could do that, and that way you could get the full uninterrupted Bible class lesson, and then afterwards we can do the Q&A uh, similar to the way we would do it um, when we were be in the building, when we had the lesson. And um, Mo Nelson, bless you. Um, oh, Desiree's on the line. My niece trying to get spiritual. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Sister Worthen, God bless you. God bless you. Yeah, God bless you. So uh, looking at, at ways... Uh, 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 Brother John from from Liberia, you on the line? God bless you, John. All the way, uh, Pastor John, all the way from uh, Liberia, just sent in. He's on the line. He said hi. Uh, John, you can't call me. I'm doing Facebook Live. <laughs> oh, my brother, my brother, my brother, my brother. All right. Uh, let me start sharing some. Um, 
Well, we got a little time. I got I got time. I ain't, it's not even 12 o'clock yet. I don't want to rush too soon and have to repeat myself. I'm probably going to do it anyway. Got a great lesson, I believe, set up for us today. Good to see Tanya Reeves on the line. Praise the Lord. All the way from Georgia. Polly Moore on the line. All right, Polly. I trust all is going well with you and and your boo, and that the marriage and everything is going great. Sister Yvonne on the line. God bless you. God bless you. I don't know why folks will try to call and text me while I'm in Bible class, but hey, I love you anyway. We're going to keep going forward. Right now, I'm focused on this, on this lesson as we are, are trying to uh, learn how to hear the voice of God. And we'll be sharing some, uh, some more information. Let me see who else is on the line. Lily is on the line. All right, Sister Lily. I see you trying to see if I missed anybody because y'all be moving kind of fast. Or well, I'm kind of slow, one of the two. Uh, yeah, trying to see if I, yeah, 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 yeah. Who else? Who else? All right, let's see. I think I caught everybody. Some of y'all on here two or three times, several of you. But I'd, uh, I'm glad to have you on. Uh, got a good number. Brother Tompkin, oh my God, my Bible college buddy. God bless you, man. Pastor Tompkin, Tompkin is an uh, uh, old school pal of mine. Brother Joe Binion is on the line. Bless you, Joe. Got to talk, uh, we got to follow up our conversation. Sister Priscilla is on the line. I hope you and your daughter is doing fine, staying safe. Heather the Hall. God bless you, girl. Uh, <laughs> our, our grief ministry, grief sharing ministry is going to be quite uh, something to behold when this is over. As uh, we're going to have to uh, massage that some. Um, to really minister to people where they're at, because this is really, really challenging, really challenging um, as we go forward. Um, in the days and weeks ahead, listen, um, I don't know how many of you have heard some of the latest uh, numbers to come out, but it appears that uh, for all the deaths that have um, we've endured and all the sickness we have endured, uh, for the sake of profit, for the sake of business, our country seems to be going forward with putting that over people. And consequently, the scientists and the health departments are projecting uh, that um, we're probably just better, a little better than halfway, if we're halfway with the numbers of people who are, are going to die. And so we must be careful, real careful as we go forward. As I've said from the beginning, we must be prayerful and careful um, that um, we uh, practice uh, healthy living. Um, and that means keeping our distance. That means uh, wearing face masks. That means washing our hands. Uh, that means washing our hands. Uh, that means washing our hands. Uh, repeatedly, we started out singing that song, great, but then we got away from it with just face masks and gloves. Uh, all that's good, but um, we must uh, be mindful that this uh, disease have no respected person. It is uh, not a white thing or a black thing. It's not an old thing or a young thing. Uh, it's a people thing, and all of us must be careful. Um, it is so, so sad whenever I have to go and perform uh, one of these funerals nowadays uh, because people are grieving so hard, some cases, and uh, you're reluctant to hold them, to hug them, uh, barely stand in their presence. And that's, that's not the Christian way. It's not the godly way. And it's, it's challenging for us all, but yet it's safe for us all. It's, uh, news reports have already been out of folks uh, large numbers attending funerals, and then large numbers of those who attend the funerals contacted and died from the virus. And so we got to be safe. We have to be safe. And um, from what is being shared now, um, we're barely halfway through. So for the next three months, yeah, three months is is sickening uh, that we have to go through this. Because
because we're not getting one leadership from the top. And so everybody doing their own thing. Kind of remind me of Judges, what we're going to be looking at today. The season of life where every, everybody did what was right in their own, in their own eyes. And uh, so I'm just praying that you continue to be careful. As I told you from the beginning, that I need each and every one of you, uh, members of El Bethel, to uh, make it a, a real discipline that you spend time with God in prayer every day, that you read his word every day, that you seek to, uh, to live out his word by seeking someone you can love and someone you can help out uh, every day. And as you seek to help people, to love people right where they are, to get them uh, where you believe God will have them to be, then that's going to require more prayer, and that's going to require more reading of the Word. Uh, it's that kind of discipline that's going to get us through uh, and not become uh, bitter over this. Uh, one other thing i say about this before I move on to other issues that I want to share with the church about. Uh, May is Mental Health Month, and uh, in the church where uh, for a long time we wouldn't talk about mental health. It was like uh, all you need is Jesus, and all you need is a word and all you need is prayer. Uh, well, mental health is as crucial to our better being as eyeglasses to somebody who uh, wear glasses, uh, to a hearing aid to someone who has a uh, problem hearing, as uh, uh, blood pressure medicine is to those who have hypertension, uh, and other things that we do to aid ourselves in life. And uh, when the wires don't connect, all together in the head when we can't always comprehend what's going on in our world, um, it can make us, it can push us to make some unhealthy decisions. And I bring this up because not because, uh, just because May is Mental Health Month, uh, it has uh, come to my attention that quite a few people uh, in this season of death and, um, and sickness and the inability to determine where it's coming from or when you have it or how much time you have uh, once you get it, you know, is very depressing to people. And because we have to practice social distance and because some of us have become afraid to interact with other people at all, uh, a lot of people are spending too much time alone. And while we, I, I totally agree and support the fact that we ought to practice uh, physical distance, Socially, we need to stay connected. We need to stay connected with each other by phone, by text, by FaceTime, however way. We need to stay connected. We need to let others know that they matter. And we need to let others know that we still know that we matter. And it, it's for our well-being. Uh, you often hear me say this, El Bethel, we'll never be our best self by ourselves. We need other people. And guess what? Other people need us. And so I, I want to encourage you to continue to reach out to one another and reach out to family and friends, and particularly that, that introvert who don't ever call you unless they want something or need something, but uh, call them anyway and check on them and make sure that they are doing okay and, um, and give them some sense of value because we all need each other. We really do. And the way we're going to get through this and get through this, uh, not just this month on mental health, but get through this season of, of struggle, this, this storm that we're going through, that we're going to have to continue to support and encourage and pray for one another. Um, so that's, that's all I want to say about mental health. But it goes on beyond the month. And uh, listen, ain't nothing wrong with seeing Jesus and a therapist. Ain't nothing wrong with talking with the Bible says, in the multitude of counselors come good wisdom. And uh, you need to talk to other people. You, you need to talk. If what you're saying is true, you talk to other people, it'll confirm it. If what you're saying is crazy, you talk to other people, <laughs> they'll let you know, don't do that. Don't do that. So just, just talk. I know people get on your nerve. You know, I get tired of people. Jesus got tired of people. He had to go still away, but he still interacted with people. And he didn't just interact with good people. He interacted with the hoochies and the hookers and the hustlers. And they all loved them. They all loved them. And they all, they'll love you, too, if you be, just be real with them. All right, uh, let me uh, give a few more shots out before I get these other announcements and we get into our lesson. Unless y'all got some questions. I thought y'all might have some questions. I think I hollered at Ann already. Nakaya's on the line. Sister Spencer's 
watching. Sister Randall and Deacon Randall is watching. Crystal is watching. Keita is back on watching along with Joe Robinson. Hey, pray for Terrence. Headed to Houston. I'm praying. I'm praying. There's a lot of prayers that are needed. Sister Paulette White. Daniqua is on the line. Congratulations, uh, Daniqua, for her graduation. Yvonne is on the line. Cheryl is back with us. Hey, Cheryl. God bless you, girl. Uh, Brother Gary Guns. Mother Roundtree on the line. Hey, Andre's on the line. Eric is on the line. Anita and uh, my mother is back. Hey, well, my mother's on Facebook. We're doing something. We're doing something here. Hey, God bless you, Sister Jennings. Uh, let me see if I can catch up. And then Janice Fraley, I trust you and uh, AJ doing good, Janice. Nancy Jones is on the line with us again. God bless you. God bless you. Um, let me share with you uh, a couple of uh, ideas we kind of floating around. Well, one uh, follow-up with the church anniversary as we celebrating the just celebrated the 80th church anniversary. And because of the pandemic, we weren't able to come together as we normally did. And we gave the assessment on the last day. And uh, just wanted to let you know, for those who didn't hear it then, that we're giving a couple of months for people to give their assessment in that regards, uh, $80 uh, for the 80 years or anywhere. Some of us are struggling and uh, to give $80 over two months will be somewhat of a challenge. For some, it's not a challenge. For some, we have uh, saved or we have income coming in uh, even during the pandemic. And so we're, we're pretty good. And for the 80th year uh, mile uh, marker, milestone, I think we ought to give something sacrificially uh, Lady Glass and I are giving $800, and I ask and challenge those uh, to join us who could. And we've had several who said that they would and uh, join us in that process. And um, so you have uh, the month of May and June to, uh, to, to uh, pay on your church anniversary assessment. Uh, our ladies, our, our young ladies and uh, and and young ladies, you ain't getting me in that trouble. Our ladies, <laughs> our, our women's ministry is initiating what they call a big sister, little sister program. And uh, in the big sister, little sister program, they are connecting um, uh, older women with younger women and then the younger adult women with even teenage girls to uh, partner up a, or form a mentoring, a mentorship between them. Uh, you can see Sister Crystal um, uh, Thomas, and I did not print her information, but I get it to you. Um, uh, uh, for those who are on the Wings uh, page, you can go to the Wings page, and they will have that information there. Wings is our Women's in God's uh, Service uh, Ministry, and um, you can go there, and they're connecting um, the sisters, one with another, just mentoring, as we all realize we need mentoring. Talked a little bit about that last week in the Bible class lesson. Looking to do something with our men for next month. Brothers, you could be looking out for a, a Zoom blast from, uh, from me and, uh, and the men's ministry shortly that we could uh, start getting our ducks uh, in order for next month's celebration as well. Well... Uh, I'm trying my best to keep this under my hat because I got a plan. And um, perhaps now I, I promise on Sunday, which is Mother's Day, in fact, that'd be a good time to roll it out. Mother's Day would be, a, uh, be the day I roll out our, our plan to get um, everybody to church. Going to try to get everybody to church. And you said, Pastor, wait a minute, is it clean? Wait a minute, Pastor, is it legal? Wait a minute, Pastor, did the Lord say so? I got that. I got all of that. Um, but we have a plan uh, to get uh, folks to church in a safe uh, way. And you ought to know me by now, uh, Sister Rowry, not to say no until you hear all the details. Uh, that I would not put anybody's life in danger um, or anything like that. Uh, but a creative way we can come together uh, as the people of God, and uh, be meaningful in our coming together, uh, prayerful in our coming together, be purposeful in our coming together, and all of us will be be the better of it. Uh, but I'm working on something 
uh, with one of our groups, and um, I'll share that on uh, Sunday morning with the details. We'll roll that out for soon and very soon. I'm hoping, I'm hoping, I'm really hoping uh, in some shape, form, or another, I will see your face. Uh, again, I'm going to make this appeal, about to run out of time with this appeal, about those who uh, uh, haven't sent in a picture. You better send in a picture because uh, church going to be together. And you need to be represented uh, in our, in our, our picture uh, uh, show. So uh, that being said, I didn't see any questions. Let me see. Uh, can I bring it to the church? Can you bring what to the church, Janice? I don't know. Oh, your picture. You want to bring your picture to the church? Yeah, you can bring it to the church. Put it in the mailbox. How about that? That'll be fine. Uh, just put picture on the outside of the of the envelope, uh, so we'll know. You know, when we open it up, we won't be too scared too fast. <laughs> you know, I'm just joking with you, girl. Love you to love you to life. Listen, um, we've been um, uh, focusing in on uh, learning and discovering the voice of God uh, for our life, and uh, as we go forward, uh, last week we looked. Um, into the uh, the story of uh, 1 Samuel 3 and how Samuel, uh, young Samuel, discovered the voice of God and didn't recognize it was the voice of God and how that uh, worked out for him and how he needed a mentor to help him uh, recognize the voice and how to respond to the voice. Uh, this week I want to look at... Um, um, this week, I want to look at um, another individual who um, kind of challenged the voice of God and wanted to know if for sure this is really God or not. And uh, our study today is going to take us to the book of Judges, um, chapter, chapter 6. Yeah, chapter, chapter 6. Yeah, God, uh, Judges... Chapter 6 this week, I uh, want us to look at how Gideon leaned uh, in to learn and recognize the voice of God and why it was important for him to grow to that point where he could recognize the voice of God in his relationship with God because God moves and God speaks in different ways. And uh, if you want to know how to hear and recognize God's voice, Gideon gives us some insights about how God speaks to us. But before we read the text, uh, let's just have a word of prayer. God, how we love you and how we bless you for today. You are awesome, God. You are really, really awesome, and you do wonderful things in our lives. You are keeping us in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of the deaf angel riding back and forward, uh, through, to and forth throughout all the land, oh God. You are keeping us, and for that we bless your name. So many have gone on, and we are often saddened and grieved, but you keep us. You are the great comforter, O oh God, and for that we bless your name. Not understanding the whys of what we are going through, but we know that we're going through because of you, and we bless your name. We pause in this moment as we come online through the Internet. We pause to invite you in that you might bless our understanding and bless our comprehension and bless our reading. Bless me, O oh God, to feed and bless this, your people, as we look at the story of Gideon afresh, O oh God. Let your Holy Spirit use me as only you can. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, Mother Bernice Jones on the line. Praise the Lord. That encouraged my heart. 87 years old, and she is on Facebook. Praise God. Hey, Carmen. Glad to see all y'all online. Listen. Let me uh, read this story because this story illustrates various ways God speaks to us and how we can respond. Some of us are familiar with this story. The overall, I want to try to dig into some details and see if we can uh, help you out with the lesson. All right, let's go. I'm reading from the New King James Version of Judges chapter 6. Kind of lays the groundwork of what's going on. Uh, in the life of the children of Israel and how Gideon gets introduced uh, on the scene. Here's what it says. Then the children of Israel did evil 
in the sight of the Lord. I'm going to give some commentary as we go through this. Uh, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Midian for seven years. And the hand of the Midian prevailed against Israel because the Midianites, because of the Midianites, the children of Israel uh, made for themselves dens and caves and strongholds that are in the mountain. Let me commentate a little bit. Of, let me give some commentary on that for a minute. Uh, the children of Israel did wrong, and God chastised them. And God's chastisement don't last for, you know, when God finally decides he's going to chastise us, it's usually not something that lasts for a minute or two because he understands that when we have those quick chastisement, we recover quickly, but we don't learn too good. And so God, when God finally put the chastisement on us, it's for a minute. And that's what happens with the children of Israel. They, they, they would do this thing repeatedly. They would cry out to God and God would hear their cry and God would send a deliverer. And when God sent a deliverer, they would respond to the deliverer. They would live like the deliverer said, like the judge said. And then as soon as the deliverer or the judge would die or leave, then Israel would go back to doing what they wanted to do. It's like they never learned the lesson. Here's what it's like. It's like having a, a classroom where the students only behave while the teacher is in the room. As soon as the teacher leaves the room, they go back to being kids. They go back to being wild uh, behaving individuals again. That Such was the case was the children of Israel. And so God chastised them by delivering them over to the hand of one of their enemies and they had their hand on them for seven years, for seven years. And uh, the way the Israelites learned to survive was that uh, they had to hide in the caves, in the mountains, because down on the level ground where the enemy could see them, the enemy would wait on them to grow crops and grow food and, and uh, grow buildings and progress. Then the enemy would come and destroy everything they had. Listen to what it says in verse 3. And so it was... Whenever Israel had sown, uh, the Midianites would come up. Also, the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. And then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no substances for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents coming in as numerous as locusts. Both they and their camel were without number. There's so many they couldn't even count them. And they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Listen, I don't care how bad you are. You can always pray. You can always pray. And uh, the end of verse 6 says, so the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Verse 7 says, and it came to pass, hallelujah, when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, Thus saith the Lord, God of Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptian, and out of the hand of all who oppressed you, and drove them out before you, and gave you their land. I also gave, I also said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Listen, I want you to notice here in verse 8 that the prophets were not plentiful back then. Uh, in fact, they were judged, they were uh, going out of uh, uh, prophets. Uh, and here is a prophet, uh, a speaker of God who shows up. He's a nameless prophet, but he speaks. You need to pay attention to this. That God speaks through his prophets. He speaks through his mouthpiece. And he tells them about what God had done for him. He said, I told you what to do. I told you what I've done for you. I told you how to behave, but you did not obey me. You did not obey me. God's voice, you want to know how to hear God's voice? You can hear God's voice through the prophets that he sends to his people. Yes, he can send, uh, um, you can hear God's voice through the prophets that God sends to his people. Listen, God speaks to everybody. Don't get it twisted. God is a, is a universal God. He's a global God. He speaks to everybody, but he only license a few. He only anoints and authorize a few to speak for him. And there is a difference where God speaks to you. 
that everything God speaks to you is not for everybody else. Preachers and teachers, we learn that all the time. That everything God give me in study, everything God give me in preparation is not for presentation. That sometimes what he's given me in preparation is for me. That sometimes the chef is not to serve up everything that he cooked. Sometimes the chef have to eat some of his own food. Yeah. Yeah, God speaks to everyone, but he only authorized and anoints a few to speak for him. Well, let's look at this. Let's, let's look at this before I get too caught up on my time. Verse 11, we are starting to get introduced to, to Gideon. He said, now the angel of the Lord. Now, before it was just a prophet who spoke. But now, verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebreth tree, which is in Ophrah which belonged to Joash, say with me, the Abrazite, uh, while his son Gideon threshed the wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. Here's what it says, that Gideon's dad uh, had a piece of property that had a tree on it, and the angel of the Lord sat under the tree that was on Gideon's dad's property. That's all that says. And it says that Gideon was, was hiding out, beating the wheat, in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites because he didn't want the Midianites to get his boon farm. I mean, get his wine. He didn't want to get that. Didn't want to get that. No, no. Didn't want him to get his, his, his didn't want him to get his, his, his barefoot. No, he didn't want him to get that. And, um, and, and, and verse 12 said, and the angel of the Lord, watch this, he not only was sitting underneath the tree, but the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you you mighty man of valor. A couple of notes real quick. As we talk about uh, discovering the voice of God or hearing the voice of God, learning the voice of God, notice about this angel. This angel appeared. He could be seen. There was a physical substance there. This, this, was, some, this was someone that Gideon could see. The angels of the Old Testament often appeared and looked just like human beings. They were often not recognized as angels until after they left. This angel appeared and he pronounced God's presence and he pronounced Gideon's strength. Listen to what he says. The Lord is with you. He speaks. God is speaking through it, the angel of the Lord and he says, I'm here. And not only does he say, I'm here, he identifies what, what Gideon was. So you are a mighty man of valor. It, it seemed contradictory because at the time Gideon is high now. He's hiding out. And so Gideon's uh, response to the angel of the Lord is simply this. Oh, if, if you are my Lord or if God is really with us, if the Lord is with us, then why is all this happening? Why is all this happening? Where are all his miracles which our father said? Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord had forsaken us and turned us over to the, the hands of the Midianites. Here's what uh, uh, Gideon is saying. Okay, if God is with us and you're saying the Lord is with us, if God is with us, then why are we going through what we're going through? Sound like something somebody might say today. If God is with America, then why is America going through what she's going through? If God is with the church, why is the church going through what it's going through? Because it appears, I don't know, I don't have all the names, I don't have all the records, but it appears that the majority of the people that seem to be dying, that seem to be are leaving here are really good people. I mean, church-going people, faithful people. Ain't nobody perfect. I got that. We all see and come short of the glory of God. I'm not trying to make no, no little Jesus out of anybody, but some really good people, really God-fearing people that's being called home and people that's doing good, even those that may not be known well in the church, they're doing good in the neighborhood. It's a lot of people going, and the question is, okay, if God is with us, if God, if God is with us, then why, why so many of us are dying? So many people are leaving here. So many pastors, so many bishops, so many apostles, so many preachers, so many church leaders, so many mothers. Why, why are so many dying? Why are so many leaving here? And that was uh, Gideon. Gideon just was keeping it real. Okay, God, you got to worry for me about you, you're with me and that I'm supposed to be so great. If you with me, skip me being great. If you with me, then why are we going through what we're going through? Gideon's questions, God's presence. Gideon questions God's presence because of the predicament they were in. And sometimes 
We either don't hear God or we dismiss God's voice because our predicament, our problems, or our pain is so big and so great that we don't think that God can really be talking to me, not in this mess. No, not in this mess, because first of all, if God is God, and if he's with me, why am I in this mess? Could I really be in a mess and God be there? Well, to deny that God is in the mess is to deny that God could be in the fiery furnace. It's to deny that God would come down to this world and live with us. It would, it would deny that God uh, could be a very present help in a time of trouble. That the only way you know he's a healer is that he has to allow you to get sick so he could get with you. And you know that it wasn't a doctor, it wasn't a medicine, but it was God. The only way you know he's a provider, you got to lose everything you got just about for him to show up and to make a way out of no way. Yeah, that, that you can't allow your, your predicament, and that's what, that's what uh, uh, Gideon was doing. He was allowing their current circumstances to tell him and to share with others that God can't be with us because if God was with us, we wouldn't be going through what we're going through. Nothing could be further from the truth. And what I love about it is that uh, God takes Gideon's passion and turns it around on him. Look at verse 14. Because uh, even though Gideon's response to God's voice talking to him could almost be insulting, uh, God doesn't stop talking. That's why I tell folks when you're angry, when you're passionate, when you're, when you're feeling some kind of way about what you sense God has done, I dare you to go ahead and talk to him about it. He can handle your frustration. He can handle your anger. He, he, he welcomes your passion because he knows how to redirect your passion. That's exactly what he does to Gideon here. This is what he says in verse 14. Then the Lord turned to him and said, turned to him and said, which means God's still talking to him. Go in this might of yours. <laughs> Go in this passion of yours. Go in this anger of yours. Go in this concern of yours. And you shall save Israel from the hands of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? You see, Gideon's passion is connected to his purpose. And God sends him to battle with the passion that he has about the absence of God. And you need to understand that what, what, gets, you, uh, what, what gets you mad could be the basis for your ministry. It, it, was, it was Saul's passion to be legally right that pushed him to understand the law of God and become the great apostle that he became. Listen, if abuse of the elderly gets you mad, then perhaps elderly abuse is your ministry. If child molestation gets your blood crawling, then perhaps the children's ministry is your ministry. Whatever stirs your passion is a clue to your purpose in ministry. And God was telling Gideon that his purpose was wrapped up in his passion. So, oh, you mad about the Israelites going through what they're going through with the Midianites? Oh, okay. Then let's get up and use that passion and do something about it. You see, anybody can complain. Any child could tear something down. But it takes a mature person to take that same energy and say, you know what, I'm going to build something out of this. I'm going to make something good out of this. I am not going to stay down with this. And so he says, uh, 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 Gideon's response is, oh, oh, Lord, how, how can I, that night goes to his, his, his part, how can I save Israel? Listen, I, I come from the weakest a uh, 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 clan, I come from the weakest family, and I'm the youngest in my family. I'm the weakest in my family. And, and, and God said, look, that, that, don't, that don't bother me. Verse 16, God again speaks to him. I love this part because as we talk about the voice of God, I want you to watch how this voice evolves. Because uh, it, it initially God, God tells him, you're a mighty man of God, you know, and I'm with you. And then God tells him, go and use this passion to do something purposeful. And then uh, God tells him in verse uh, uh, 16, surely I'm going to be with you. He reaffirms, I'm with you. And you know, that's really all we really need. That's, that, that's, that's you know, I, I've learned in my life, you know, stop asking God. I don't ask God so much the why and the why me and the why now and how long. Two questions I ask. God, are you with me? And if you're with me, I'm cool. The other question I ask, 
God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to respond? And so God gives them this assurance in verse 16. Look, I will be with you and you will defeat the Midianites. He gives them that. He, he gives them that. And, 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 and Gideon begins to show a part of his immaturity as a believer because we, we believe on different levels. We believe on, on different levels and we have to grow to be strong. None of us are born strong. None of us are born grown in, in Christ. We're born babes in Christ. And ain't nothing wrong with being a babe. And there's nothing wrong with feeling uh, a, a bit insecure from time to time. Uh, but, but you ought not to let your insecurity deny your faith. Uh, the man that, that had the son that the disciples couldn't heal said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And the truth about most Christians is that we have some real faith but we also have some unbelief mixed up in there sometime. And so Gideon, uh, after hearing God said that he was going to be with him and that he would win the battle against the Midianites, he says, now, if I found favor in your sight, I need a sign. Now, if there's any problem that's, that, that really speaks to, to uh, Gideon's immaturity, it is the fact that he repeatedly needed signs from God, even though God spoke to him. He still needed a sign. And this is where Gideon asked for the first sign. He said, listen, if, if you're really God, you, you angel of the Lord that's sitting under the tree that I saw sitting under the tree that then got up and started talking to me and called me great and mighty and told me that I was going to be victorious. If, if you really are who you say you are, then I've learned enough about my history that I ought to worship you. I ought to bring you an offering. And so in verse 17, he talks about, he said, here's the sign I want you to give me. I want you to stay here until I go inside and I get an offering, prepare an offering and bring it out to offer to you. Because if you are God, you cannot be God and I don't do something about that. You cannot be in my presence and I don't honor you for being in my presence. You didn't have to do it, but you came here. And so I owe you something. So would you please, if you are who I think you are, and if I'm going to do what you say I'm going to do, then stay here until I go inside and I bring out my offering and I set it up before you. And God speaks to him again at the end of verse 18. He said, I will wait until you come back. God is such a gentleman. He's always uh, given us opportunity to grow and to be all that uh, uh, he wants us to be. And when Gideon says something like, look, if this is you, really you, then I have to give you an offering that's in my house. Oh, my God. And he asks for this confirmation. If, if God is really there, he said, don't, don't leave till I come back. And, and he offers uh, 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 real hospitality there. And Gideon asks his messenger of God to wait until he comes back. And the angel of the Lord agrees. And listen, when God speaks, when God speaks, we ought to honor his word. Whenever he speaks, whether he's speaking through the prophet, as we saw earlier, whether he's speaking through the angel uh, or whether we're going to find later, whether he's speaking through his spirit uh, or whether he's speaking through our circumstances. When God speaks, we ought to honor his word. We, we ought to honor his speak word. When God speaks, we ought to honor uh, the fact that he's he's recognizing us by speaking to us. Listen, God don't have to speak to nobody. Let's make this clear. He does not have to speak to anybody. So when God does give you a word, you ought to acknowledge it. Because listen, just, just to say God spoke to me, just to know God speaks to me, gives me more value. And so when God speaks, we ought to honor his word. When God speaks, we ought to honor the fact that he recognizes us by speaking to us. When God speaks, we ought to seek to do whatever he says do. Yeah. Toward the, uh, in the 20th verse of this chapter, we find God speaking again through the angel, through the angel of God. The angel of God said unto him, take the meat, because this is what, um, in verse 19, we see what, what Gideon brought out. He brought out a, a young goat, some unleavened bread, and some flour. Uh, the meat he put in a basket. He put the broth in a pot, and he brought them out to him underneath the tree, because the angel of the Lord is still underneath the tree, and he presented it to him. And the angel of the Lord, which is the uh, pre-incarnate Christ, uh, said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay it on the rock and pour it on. He gives them instruction on how to set up the meal. He said, when he did so, the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff, that stick that was in his hand. He touched the meat and the unleavened bread and fire arose from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. 
And suddenly, just like the smoke that consumed the meat and the smoke that consumed uh, the bread, the smoke that appeared, the angel disappeared. And oh my God, when the angel disappeared, Gideon knew that he had heard from God and he had seen God. Watch how the text, I hope you got a Bible that you, you can read this uh, uh, as, as you see the evolution of how God voice and God speaks to this, this man of God. He first uh, 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 speaks through the prophet to the children of Israel, not to, not to get it, he speaks to the children of Israel, saying, you are in this predicament because you disobeyed me. But then he shows up and speaks to, to Gideon. He says, I'm with you. The Lord is with you. And you are a mighty man of valor. And, and he, he gives them other instructions. And by the time he offers up his offering, by the time he offers up his offering, uh, the angel disappears. And Gideon realized, like you and I realize sometime, after God has spoken, after God has done something, we look back and we say, oh, my God. That was none but God. That was none but I didn't know that angel. That, didn't, that had to have been an angel. It had to be. been. But at the time, we just think it's a natural conversation. The angel departed, and Gideon is having a moment in verse 22. He said, oh, at last, oh, my Lord, for I have seen the angel of the Lord. He said, I'm about to die. I'm, I'm going, I know I'm going to die. And then God, verse 23, God speaks again. There's no angel present. There's no prophet present. But God speaks. Because God doesn't need a physical presence to speak. See, we often looking for somebody. And God can use a body. And God can use a voice. But he has his own voice. Verse 23, and the Lord said to him, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. You shall not die. Before, before, listen, before this, we had a voice and a presence. Now we have a voice and no presence. And Gideon responded to this voice. The same way he responded the first time by giving an offering, this time he built an altar. He built an altar and called it the Lord is peace. Now it came to pass in verse 25, now it came to pass that same night the Lord spoke to him again. We're going to find if you go through this chapter eight times, eight times God speaks to Gideon. It's important that you note that because the time is going to come when God is not going to speak the way he used to speak. Because Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, and I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. It's kind of like what we're going to see, how God does when speaking to us. That he's very clear, he's very concise, he's very concrete, he's very contemporary in early on of our growing. But as we grow older, he expects us to not have to lean and depend on, on verbalage, as much as we can hear in our spirit. And so he speaks here in verse 25, and I came to pass that same night, the Lord said to him, now i got given him some details here. Now before it was just, you're going to be good, you're going to be victorious. But now God gives him an assignment. He said, go to take your father's young bull, take the seven, uh, take the second bull of the seven-year-old and tear down the altar of Baal. Hold up, hold up, tear down the altar of Baal that your father has. Now that tells us that Gideon's dad is worshiping false gods. Mm. You mean God going to call someone to be a leader for him whose parents were ungodly? Yes. God can do whatever he want to do. And in verse uh, uh, in this verse 25 and, and 26, uh, God is telling, telling Gideon to go and destroy the idol god uh, uh, that would have been built up by his dad because his dad and those in the community had all worshipped this false god. He said, go cut it down. And Gideon took about 10 men, verse 27, took about 10 men with him. And, uh, and because he feared the men of the city and his father's uh, household, he didn't do it during the day. He did it at night, but he did it. He, he did it. He did it. He did it. Listen, we honor God when God speaks. We honor God with offerings. 
Because when God speaks, we say, God, I, I can't pay you for talking, but I'm so glad that you did talk. Because you talk, that means I matter. Because you talk, that means I'm somebody. Because you talk, you recognize me if don't nobody else recognize me. So we, we honor God with our offerings. That's what he did at first. And then we honor God with our sacrifices. Because that's what he did when he built the altar. He said, look, I, I'm willing to give up my sacrifice. I gave, went in the house and got the best I had to offer to you and the sacrifice but also we honor God with our obedience. Listen, even if you do it at night, even when you do it when ain't nobody else looking, you still need to do whatever God told you to do. That's what happened uh, with Gideon in verse 27. In verse 28, when the people arose the next day and saw that the, the altar of Baal had been torn down, they wanted to know who did it. And after inquiring, they found out in verse 29 that Gideon had did it, and they went after Gideon by going after going to his dad's house. I said, send your son out here. He tore down the altar. <laughs> he said, send your son out here. He tore down the altar. And the dad was a good father. He said, look, I'm not sending my son out there. Because uh, if you if, if Baal is supposed to be so much God, Baal can defend himself. He said, so you don't have to stand up for Baal. Baal is a God. He can defend himself. And so they named, they renamed uh, uh, Gideon from, from Gideon to, to Jezbaal, which, which means uh, 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 him who plead for Baal, uh, who had torn down the, the altar of Baal. Uh, jump down to verse uh, 33. Uh, in verse 33, it said, Then all the, the Mennonites and Amalekites, the people from the east, gathered together, they crossed over. Now here where we see the enemies of Israel gathering gathering in big numbers to attack Israel. Stay with me. Stay with me because here's where the voice of God begins to get bigger. And we, we got to learn how to be more sensitive to God's, what God is saying to us, where he may have spoke to us very clearly in our early days. As we grow, he moves in another direction, that he could go from a prophet to an angel. He go from an angel to just his voice inside of us. But watch what happens here, uh, and in and, and verse 34, it said, but the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. No voice, just the spirit. Something within him moved him, moved his passion, moved him to, to know it was time to do something different. And Gideon did something that he hadn't done before. He blew the trumpet, the, the, the war horn. He, he blew the trumpet, the, the praise horn. And I don't know whether he thought the folks would praise, join him in a praise dance or, change, or, or join him in a war dance. But he, when the spirit came upon him, he did something he had never done before. Because in recognizing the voice of God, you have to also recognize the move of God. And, and Gideon blew the trumpet. And when he blew the trumpet, the text says that his, his family, the Amorites, gathered behind him, that, that his clan joined in behind him to support him. And then when he had all the soldiers together, when he got the soldiers of his, of his family together, he sent messengers out to four other tribes to tell them, come meet with me, come meet up with me. Listen, we're not told that Gideon heard God in this, but that simply that the spirit of the Lord came upon him. And the next thing we know that Gideon acted. Sometimes we are moved by what we hear. Sometimes we are moved by what the Spirit does within us. Gideon did done something that he had never done before. He blew the horn, not knowing exactly what the response would be, but his clan, the Amorites, gathered behind him. Then he called for others to join him from four other tribes because Gideon blew the horn and sent for them. And God touched their heart and they came. Now Gideon is approaching in our text, Gideon is approaching the proverbial, the proverbial fork in the road. That where well, you got to make a choice, you got to do something here now, Gideon. If you done blew the horn for battle, and you done called the soldiers together for battle, there has to be a battle. And Gideon, recognizing the seriousness of the situation and the consequences, if he's wrong, he seeks another sign from God. Is that famous sign that we often talked about with Gideon? Because Gideon goes out before God, and here's where I want to help you as children of God understand when signs are good and when signs are not. Because we often want to test God, 
and, and the Bible says you ought not to tempt the Lord your God, and you ought not to test him. You, you ought not to provoke him. You ought not to put him to the test, whereas if he do it, he's God. If he don't, he's not. Not after God has done so much for you already. And, and, but Gideon says to here, he has this if ministry. And he, he tells God, if you will save Israel by my hands, as you have said, look, I, I shall put this fleece of wool on the threshing floor. And if there is dew on the fleece only in the morning, and if it is dry on the ground, then I will know you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. You know the story. He takes, he takes the fleece and he put it on the ground. He said, look, in the morning, I want all the dew on the fleece. I want the ground to be dry. If you do that, then I know you spoke to me. And so he wakes up the next day. The ground is dry. The fleece is so wet, he could wring a whole bowl of water into it. So like it should be the end of the deal. But you know, we always want more than one amen. We want more than one confirmation. And so Gideon throws it back at God. Okay, God, okay, 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 God. Don't, don't be mad with me. Don't be mad with me. Please don't be mad with me. And I appreciate that part of the conversation because it shows that he's humbling himself before God. And he says, God, okay, let, 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 let's flip this around. Let, let the ground be wet and the fleece be dry. And so the next day he puts it out there and he comes back and sure enough, the fleece is dry while the ground is wet. Now, what do you do with all that? Because um, these signs that, that um, Gideon calls for seems to be challenging his faith and challenging ours. Let me give you a couple of points and we'll wrap this up. First of all, signs are for the immature and the insecure. And there's nothing wrong, as I said earlier, with being a babe. Babes in Christ require signs. They, they don't have the security of knowing a pattern that you're going to always be there. So they, they need to be comforted. And then uh, uh, those who are insecure, those who are fearful but trying, uh, 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 the man said, I believe but help my unbelief. And, and Gideon was saying, I want to go and I want to be bold. I got, I blew the horn. I have uh, called the soldiers together. And I know you said that I'm supposed to be the, the champion of the people, but, but I just need to have this confirmation from you. Now that's good. That's good that we want confirmation, but we also need to know that when God has already repeatedly revealed himself to be who he say he is to you, and for us to ask or demand a sign is really insulting. And, and, and God is so gracious at times that even after walking with him year after year after year, he still has been so gracious to me that he can give signs, and he often does give signs. Signs are confirmation that you are walking in the right path. Signs are confirmation that you're doing his will. Because when God uh, orders us to do something, the way becomes clear. The steps of the righteous is ordered. His steps are ordered. The doors are going to open. The people who are going to be there. The support is going to be there. When you have to constantly knock down doors and constantly climb trees, it's a pretty good sign that you're probably on the wrong road. Let me tell you about God's voice. God's voice is, first of all, always consistent with his word. God is not going to tell you to do something that goes against the word of God. God's voice is always clear. Uh, it, 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 it may not make sense. Uh, or be understood, but it's clear about what it is he wants you to do. And, and whether, it's, whether it's to not doubt, whether it's to, to surrender, whether it's to act, live in humility, whether it's to be obedient, whether it's forgiveness, it's clear what he wants you to do. Um, another thing about God's word is not only it's, it's clear and it's consistent, uh, but it's convicting. And there's a difference between being condemning and being convicting. Condemning always make you feel guilty, and God doesn't make us feel guilty in the sense that there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Once I have prayed over my sins and given it to Jesus, then he takes it and throws it in the sea of forgiveness. There is no bringing it up again. If it comes up again, it's either me or the devil, but it's not God. That's condemning. But God's voice is convicting. It gives us a conviction, an inner motivation 
to do something about the situation that's at hand. That's what Gideon faced from the beginning when he said, if, you, if you're God, why are we going through all this? And God said, look, use that same energy, use that same uh, uh, motivation to go forward and make a difference in the people. God's voice is clear, it's consistent, it's convicting. God's voice also makes uh, me more Christ-like. It makes me more Christ-like, that I'm more uh, like the God that I'm supposed to be following. I'm more loving of God and loving of people. I'm more Christ-like. I'm more honoring of him and helping of others. I'm, I'm more Christ-like. See, the reason why Gideon needed to go through these, this voice training, the reason why Gideon needed to um, uh, get to this point of get beyond his signs, because the real battle was coming. Hear this. The real battle was coming, and God had told him that he would defeat the Midianites. God had told him that he would be victorious in the next chapter. I, don't have, I won't have time to read all that. I encourage you to read chapter 7. But in the next chapter, this is what goes on. Gideon has everybody together, and God tells them, you got 32,000 soldiers here. And God says, you have too many. And uh, at this point, um, Gideon is mature enough. At this point, Gideon is secure enough. At this point, Gideon has heard the voice of God and know, enough to know this was really God who said, I had too many. And, and, and said, if I let these uh, uh, go and secure the victory, they would take credit for the victory. So here's what I want you to do, Gideon. I want you to ask them who all are afraid of battle. And 22,000, I think, raised their hands. And he said, okay, dismiss him. And when he uh, dismissed him, left with about 10,000 or so. And uh, uh, um, after, uh, uh, after, 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 after he dismissed those two, God said, you still have too many. He said, take them down to the river and let them drink water. And the ones who kept their heads up and lapped from their hand uh, was, was 300. The other, uh, uh, the other ones put their face down to the water. And God said, the ones who put their face down to the water, let them go home. And Gideon is left with 300. Isn't it amazing that he didn't ask for a sign when God was dwindling down his resources? When God told him to take a cut in his help and take a cut in his support, there's no, hey, can you give me a sign? See to me, like he, that would have demanded a, a bigger sign. But here's what you need to know: God does His training for us in private. Yeah, He does His training for us in private. The way we behave in private will determine how we'll behave in public. And so, if He could trust you to to trust Him in private, in private, He'll take your questions. Would it just you and Him? Go ahead, put them to the test. Because it's just you and him. He's developing you. But now when it comes to other people whose lives are on the line, he needs you to trust him. And he don't, he don't have time to explain to us all the details of the victory. When he gives us war orders, we just have to follow the directions of the commander. And so he says to him, he said, look, you have too many. And he cuts his, his army down from 32,000 to 300. Let me ask you, how many of you, uh, once this coronavirus thing is over or even before when you say you were making 300 say you was living large you're getting thirty two thousand dollars a month and you're living large and god said you're making too much you're making too much you need to take a pay cut you need to switch jobs and god switched you up from making thirty two thousand a month to three hundred dollars a month how happy would you be how much would you go without saying, God, is this really you? This can't be you. I'm, I'm losing my mind. There's a pastor talk about, you know, mental health. Maybe I done lost my mind. I need to go talk to somebody. I'm going to give up $32,000, go down to $300. Well, that's the kind of challenge that we go through. Well, God wanted um, Gideon to learn to hear his voice, to recognize his voice, and to trust his voice, whether it was through a prophet whether it was through the angel, whether it was through the spirit, God wanted him to learn 
to recognize his voice and trust his voice because bigger battles are coming. And when the bigger battle come, God want to know, can he trust you to be obedient to what he tell you to do? Because it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about his glory. Our story is about his glory. And Gideon teaches us a number of lessons about following God's word, trusting God's word, and watching God's word, putting priority of God's word and God's voice over the world's voice, over our voice, over any other voice. Gideon took those 700, took those 300 men, and the next uh, chap chapter 7 talks about how he took those 300 men because God told him to take them. He said, well, now, if you still got some issues, watch this. If you still got some issues about me leading you, just take you and one of your good servants that I, I name, take them down to the camp and uh, see what you see. And he goes down there, and there's so many soldiers of the enemy, so many soldiers that the camels are like the sand, uh, sand pebbles on the beach. I mean, they're all over the place thousands upon thousands upon thousands all over the place and Gideon sneaks in and sneaks up to uh, one section of their camp and as he sneaks up into one section of the camp he hears a conversation of two men one man telling another man his dream he said man I had this dream and I dreamed like this great big loaf of bread rolled out of the mountain and rolled down the mountainside down in the valley now, I don't know how you make any sense out of a bread loaf of bread rolling down the mountain but the other fella did and he interpreted for the guy without knowing anybody else was listening. He said, oh, man, you know what that was? That was nothing more but the army of Gideon and the, and the army of the Lord coming down to defeat and destroy the Midianites. Oh, you know what that did for Gideon? Oh, my God. Gideon started worshiping. Gideon said, yes, God is with me. Yes, God is going to work this thing out. I didn't see it before, but I know he's going to work it out. And then he followed the, the voice of God. He followed the directions of God. Why? Because he developed a, a discerning spirit to hear the voice of God. That's what we have to do. In these crazy times, you have to have a spirit that can discern this is God, this is not God. And when you know it's God, just go forward. Just go forward. Gideon went forward, and he gave all his 300 men. Every one of them got the same thing. Every one of them got a trumpet in one hand, and they got a pitcher with a, with a lamp in it on the other hand. And, and Gideon said, just do what I do. Just do what I do. I love a leader like that. Just said, look, just do what I do, because good leaders model what they want to follow. And Gideon uh, uh, takes the horn, he blows the horn, and then he, he breaks the candle, he breaks the, the, uh, the pitcher with the noise and light the candle. And so these soldiers in the middle of the night, all they hear is the, these 300 trumpets, Represent each trumpet usually represent at least a hundred people, but there's no three. There's only three hundred people, but they don't know that in the dark because the enemy don't know what God has for you, and God, the enemy don't know how God is equipping you to defeat them. And so the men in this in the valley, the enemy has defeated themselves. Gideon didn't have to do anything. And while you worried about you know following God's voice and wondering how you're going to defeat the ones that's trying to defeat you. You don't have to worry about defeating them. When God is with you, God will make them defeat themselves. You don't have to fire nobody. They will fire themselves. You ain't got to move nobody. They will move themselves. The real key to this life is learning to hear, learn to discern the voice of God, and following that voice. Yes, following that voice. So that being said, I didn't mean to go that long. It got good to me. Um, but... Here's what we have to keep doing. We have to keep learning how to discern uh, the voice of God for our homes, uh, for our families, uh, for the sanctity, the sanity of our minds, uh, for the peace of our heart. That's the other thing about the voice of God, because the voice of God not only gives, uh, comes across clear and uh, gives conviction and makes us Christ-like, but you know you're hearing the voice of God when uh, there's a sense of peace that comes with it. Yeah, a sense of, sense of peace. It may sound crazy, but it's a peace that passes all understanding that resides within us. Man, I wish I, I, wish I had the Zoom set up now so I could uh, in, engage y'all with some, with some questions and uh, conversation um, as, uh, as a follow-up. But we'll have that going on for next week. 
uh, uh, you feel free to, to still put your questions up. I'll try to respond as I see them. But uh, God bless you. God keep you. Remember the announcement that I shared with you. Uh, do something nice for Mother. Even from a distance, you can still show Mother some love on uh, this coming Mother's Day. I'm sure she will appreciate it. And uh, if you happen not to have a mother and just happen to have a father, then uh, you can do it, do it to him. I'm looking in my hair. All of us having bad hair days nowadays, so I'm not even concerned about that. It's about to go. By the time we get back in church, I will be back bald again. Just give me a couple of more weeks. God bless you. I love you much. Thank God for you. Until next time, peace.